Hey guys, let's talk about web forms today. We're going to build a little timer application. Web forms is an older technology, but there are still a ton of websites out there that use it. And it's very different than desktop win forms and even different than MVC, uh, C sharp web apps. So I think it's still useful information and let's get started. Let's start by opening Visual Studio and then click create new project. I like to start all my applications with a blank project because we're not stuck in any kind of Visual Studio default setup and it allows me to organize my code however I want to organize it. So we're going to click blank solution and you can find it this way as well. I've already used it so it's in my project templates but if you just type in blank solution it's there so then next we're going to call this timer app i'm going to leave it in my default repos folder and there we go we have our blank solution now we want to add a new project so right click on solutions go to add new project now we're going to do a C sharp web app so we'll type that in so web app and I've already got my filter set to C sharp and web uh, we don't want to do .NET core because that gets really difficult and that's a more modern approach um, and I don't think it makes sense to really do .NET core with a web form application so we're going to go down here to sp.net web application, click on it, click next. I'm going to call this timer app dot web form and then click create. And I'm going to leave it empty because if you click one of these, you're going to get a lot of extra files and JavaScript stuff. And it, it does a whole lot for you that, is kind of overwhelming at first so if we start empty it's a lot easier to learn and do things and I'm going to uncheck configure for HTTPS to keep this as simple as possible so create and it does its thing and now we have our application web forms use an ASPX file and then what's called a code behind file. The SPX file gets converted into HTML and that's what your browser shows you when you look at it. The code behind file is where all of your C-sharp code that does whatever you want it to sits. So we're gonna start by creating a web form. So timer app web forms, right click on that and then add, go down to web form. We're going to call it index because that's just a standard. And now you can see the index file and then index ASPX.CS file. The first thing I want to do is add a few components to make sure that everything's compiling and running. So we're going to start out with some fairly easy components and they're buttons. So toolbox. And then you should see all of the components. So we're just going to drag button over. And we have a component. Now we can copy and paste this a few times. We still have to follow certain HTML semantics, but this ID is also how we're going to refer to the component in the code behind file. So we want to keep these names unique. And I'm going to change this to one, two, three, four, and five. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and add a few more. I want to be complete. Five, six, seven. Okay, so it automatically did that for us, which I wasn't expecting that. So that's kind of nice. And once we have that put in there, we can run the file with Control F5. And there are all 
of our buttons. Let's go ahead and change the text on these buttons. This actually does two things. This changes the text that's displayed on the button, but it also changes the value of the text attribute, which we will use later. Sorry, this takes forever. There we go. So in order to get these buttons to actually do anything, we have to attach a handler to them. So what we're going to do, I'm going to paste something in here. The on-click handler, and we're going to add it to every single one of them. And now we need a function called button click. Now this is going to go in the code behind file. If I were to try to compile this without this file, uh, function existing, it would not work and we get the compiler screaming at us. So let's go to the code behind file, which is this aspx.cs file. We can already see a function in there called page load. We don't really need to do anything with that right now, but we do need to go ahead and create that function. So I'm going to copy and paste. So now that we have this function here, we should be able to compile and it comes up. It doesn't do anything yet, but we'll get to that. But I want to talk about these arguments. So sender is the button itself that sent the event. So if we cast that to a button, we should be able to have access to the properties of a button. And that's where we're going to pull that text value from. Event args are any kind of arguments that are sent with the event. In this case, we're not going to do anything with those, but we still need that there to make the function call work. One thing that I like to do that gives me feedback on whether something is working or not is have a pop-up box show up when I click a button, for instance. In this case, because we're dealing with a web app, we can't really tell the web application to pop up a message when we're on the code behind. Uh, to do that, you would have to do some Ajax stuff, and that's just really complicated when you're just getting started with it. So I'm going to show you what I do. I use the message box from WinForms. Uh, message box I show got here. It doesn't like it at first because the WinForms library is not loaded. So we just need to fix that. And we're going to do this one, the windows.forms. So now if we save it and load it, and I click a button, you can see a message box has popped up. Now we can go ahead and use those attributes I mentioned earlier, the text attribute. Let's go ahead and cast the sender to a button. Now it's going to complain because I imported the windows.forms. library, but we just want to tell it that we are using a web control button here. So now when we do message box show, we can do button dot button dot text. Save it and run it. Zero. And then if I do nine, We can see that and all of these other values will show up the same way. Now that we know our events are doing something, we can go ahead and clear this out. And then I'm going to paste in a few other things that I'll talk about in just a second.
So let's talk about these components. We have a timer, we have an update panel, and we have a script manager. The script manager handles AJAX calls behind the scenes, but the update panel will not work without the script manager. The update panel is designed to refresh via AJAX or asynchronous postback, and you configure triggers here. So when this particular trigger happens, it will update this template. Now these templates have two labels for this project anyway. We have minutes left and seconds left. And then finally, we have to add a timer that we configure to go every second that will run this event handler or this event, the timer tick. And when this happens, this will cause the update panel to refresh. If we were to run this right now, we would get some compiler errors because we need to define these events. So let's go back into ASPX, the code behind file. And I'm going to paste something in. We have the same arguments as our other events here. And I think that's all that we need to make it compile. Let's see. Yep. We can see our labels there and it compiled. So we have our code behind wired up to work. Before we talk about what the timer tick event does, we need to talk about the button click event and how we're going to make this all work. So when a user clicks on a button, we need to track the number they're inputting. And then we need to convert that into minutes and seconds so that we know how long we need to count down for. So let's go back to the code behind file. I'm going to paste some stuff here. So how we're going to do this is with something called a session variable. The way web apps work is every time you go to the website, this class gets recreated and it does its thing, sends you the HTML and then it's gone. So if I were to store a timer variable here or a minute variable let's say int minutes equals you know five minutes or whatever as soon as this runs this variable goes away so as soon as you load the website you'll get access to this variable once and then it's gone so you can't add to it or modify it really in any way that's meaningful because it's gone So the way to overcome that is with the session variable. It's kind of like cookies and that's just the way you have to do it with web apps. In modern web development, there are other things you can do. So you don't have to use the session variable, but for web forms, we're kind of stuck with it. So line by line, this line checks to make sure that there's not an input time session variable already out there. So the first time you open the web page, you're not going to have the input time variable set. So when we do that, we want to set it to an empty string so we can work with it in the next line. On this next line, we're going to take that value that is in the input time session variable and we're going to convert it to a string because session objects are by default just an object so you have to convert them to whatever you need at the time you're using them and then we're just going to add the text that we sent in so if we start out with an empty string and we add a one now our input time is just the string one 
And then when we do that, we need to update the input time to the new string that we just had. Now I've done it this way because we're going to need this new time variable later. And it's just cleaner to set it to a variable and then use it that way. Now we need to talk about the two most difficult lines of code in this function. We need to be able to pull the minutes and the seconds out of the input time that our user gave to us. If I input 30 seconds, it's going to look something like that. As you can see, there are no minutes in that input. In order to tell that, we need to know that the length of the input that was given to us is more than two characters. If it's not, then we have zero minutes. So we set that to zero with this tertiary operator. Otherwise, we need to pull just the minutes section of the input now from the string. Now the way we do that is we start at the start of the string and then go all the way to the right until we get two characters from the end because the two characters at the end are the seconds. Now we need to get the seconds. In order to get the seconds, we're going to do a similar process that we did for the minutes with a few changes. In the event that a user inputs 30 seconds, then we don't need to change anything about it. We already have the substring we need, just 30. So we're going to convert that into an integer. And then you can see that on the other side of the tertiary operator. Otherwise, we need to strip off the beginning characters until we have just the last two characters. And that's what I'm doing here. Now we need to create two new session variables. We have a minutes left variable and a seconds left variable. And we set them appropriately to the variables we created a few minutes ago. Now we need to update the text of our controls on our web form to show the time in minutes and in seconds. We have a string format option here. And all this does is help with leading zeros so that it looks pretty. But if we go back to index.aspx, you can see the label display text minutes and the label display text seconds. Now let's run this and see what we have. One, two, four. So we have a minute, 24 seconds. Now we're going to add two new buttons. So we'll go back to index.aspx. Index I'm going to copy these. We have a start button and a clear button. And they are tied to the start click event and the clear click event. So let's go back to index.aspx and create those. And actually, I need to remove this. So all the start function does is it starts the timer and it clears our input time so that we're ready to input new time once the timer's over. Finally, the clear click function stops the timer, sets our minutes left and seconds left session variables to zero, and then sets our label text so the controls that we have on the web page it sets them back to zero so now we can run this again we're not going to press the start button because it doesn't really do anything yet because I haven't set up the timer tick function but we should be able to test the clear button so let's enter five minutes and 30 seconds and then clear and we're back to where we started so now the function that does all the work, the timer tick function. Let's go ahead and paste some code in here. Now remember, this code runs every time the timer counts down. So in this case, we have the timer set to run 
every 1,000 milliseconds or one second. We'll start by getting our variables that we had in the session variables. The minutes left and seconds left. Now remember, this resets every time you refresh the page. So we have to go through and cast these to a string and then parse them in order to get the actual integer values stored in those variables. Then we have this line that subtracts a second. The next few lines handle the edge cases. So if we're out of seconds and we're out of minutes, then we're done counting. So we want to tell the timer to stop. However, if we are down to zero seconds and we have minutes left, then we need to tell the minutes left to subtract one and then reset the seconds to 59 seconds so that we're counting down appropriately. Lastly, we're going to go through the label updating cycle again. And then we need to update our session variables with these two lines so that they get updated the next time they're called, they have the new values. So now we can run it. And let's enter a minute 30 seconds and then hit start. And there you go, it's counting down. It's important to note that there are still a few bugs in this application. For instance, if we typed in a minute 30 seconds, and then hit start, we can actually input new numbers while it's counting down because we're not checking that when we're inputting the buttons. So if I enter four, eight, five, whatever, it keeps counting down, but there's just some weird behavior there. And I'm sure there's a few other bugs that you'll find as well, but this covers the concepts that I wanted to cover pretty well.